is Vicarious Filidei an actual official title of the Pope? Uh, it's a good question. And that's one we're going to be covering today on this video for the Biblical Hope YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be trying to brand into the YouTube platform, if you will, um, this web page actually, that is an older one put out by a guy by the name of Michael Scheifler. Um, his official page, BibleLight.net, has long since passed on. Uh, he runs this mirror page, or there's a mirror page that's been set up with this information, but um, it's time for it to go up to YouTube forever. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Vicarious Philae uh, has long been debated on, all the way, this goes all the way back to the 17th century with Andreas Helwig. And the significances of this, it talks about, uh, there, was a, there was a biblical scripture talked about in Revelation 13, of course, about this end time antichrist. And it says, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. No man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. Now, some of the Catholics out there like to talk about, uh, for example, Ellen White and the Adventist Church. Uh, but clearly, <clears throat> Revelation 13 says it's the number of a man. So we know that this is a man who has this number. Um, you'll see this gematria uh, used and abused for all kinds of different people, but we know it's a man who has this. So there are three different characteristics that distinguish the beast. His mark, his name, and the number of his name. Uh, so numerology is a little bit important in the context of Revelation here. It might be argued by some that 666 may be applied to one man's name and that this will help identify him as the Antichrist. Um, but <clears throat> here we look at the following verse to show 666 does not need to apply solely to a man's name. Uh, and he hath on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, verse 16. The same Greek word that translates as name uh, in Revelation 13 is used in chapter 19. So clearly the word can also apply to a title, not just one man's name. We're told that it takes certain understanding and wisdom to discern how this number is actually applied. Based on the fact that 666 can apply to a title, below are several words or phrases uh, with possible solutions to the enigma of 666. So uh, under languages of the world, the numeric, numeric equivalents of the Greek letters can be found and Latinos, the Latin-speaking man, uh, the Greek word, the ancient Greek word, actually adds up to 666 according to the equivalence of Greek letters. So this is consistent also with Irenaeus, who thought that it would be the Latins who would be uh, the Antichrist power. So Latin is the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. Church documents are usually published first in Latin and translated from the Latin into other languages. So the association of Latinos with 666 is, again, first suggested by Irenaeus, uh, who proposed in his Against Heresies that it might be the name of the fourth kingdom of Daniel 7, verse 7. Latinos has the present number 666 is a very probable solution, this being the name of the last kingdom of the four seen by Daniel. For the Latins are they who at present bear rule. I will not, however, make any boast over this. Coincidence. <clears throat> so uh, here we have... Ancient Greek for the Latin kingdom, He Latina Basileia, which translates uh, to 666. Italica Ecclesia, which translates to 666. Apostates in the ancient Greek, again 666. Paradosis or tradition translates to 666. Okay, so these are standard um, numerical values that can be found in the Encyclopedia Britannica for kind of what these numbers, what they value. So here's where we get to the crux of the matter. Vicarious Philidae adds up to 666. Dukes Clerae, translated as captain of the clergy, uh, translates to 666. As does Ludovicus, translated means vicar of the court. Ludovicus. And the Hebrew letters under languages of the world, the numeric equivalents to them, Rometh means the Roman kingdom, or Romati means the Roman man. They both add up to 666 as well. So the individuals who first recognized this, possible solutions included Johannes Gerard, 1582 to 1637, a Lutheran in his Adnotationes in Apocalypse, <coughs> and uh, Rometh Vicarius Philae Duc Clare, Ordinarius Ovilus Christi Pastor and Dic Lux, 
are cited by the rector of Berlin, Andreas Helwig, of course, um, <clears throat> 16th and 17th centuries, in his Antichristos Romanus Improprio Suo Nome in Numerum Iliomum Apocalypticum, uh, Continente Proditus, published in 1612 in Wittenberg. Uh, Dux Clara was cited by Walter Brute in the 14th century, and Ludovicus was proposed by James Bacino, a British minister and author. All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> we have certain objections to the gematria of uh, vicarious, for example. Some people talk about V and I equals 6, but no, um, according to the ancient values of letters and how they were added in a name, they were not calculated that way. It would have been... Uh, uh, it would have been <clears throat> um, uh, a value of 112 actually so for example i and u does versus 4 s equaling 0 so the, there's been different ways of, of people calculating vicarious but the actual official value adds up to 666 as we see 5 1 100 1 5 u or v uh, they were both the same um, 150 1 1 501 Okay, so some people have talked about Nero's name adding up to 666, and this is most commonly seen in the Praetorists who um, take Caesar's name, or Nero Caesar, Caesar Nero, they add an N resulting in Neron Caesar, and it's transliterated into Aramaic resulting in NRWNQSR, which adds up as the, the following is 666, but... Uh, <clears throat> One example of this particular spelling was discovered in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but if you use the same process without the N, the result is 616. Um, some early manuscripts have 616 rather than 666, but even scholars such as Irenaeus attribute 616 only to a copyist error. Um, so, and the, and the problem with the above calculation is according to the rules of Jum Jewish numerology known as gematria, when the letter nun appears for the second time in the word, it is known as the final and takes the value of 700. So it adds up to 1316 and actually not 666. So the numerology here for Caesar Nero actually is incorrect. So in Strong's Concordance, uh, words 473 in the Greek dictionary, you'll find the word anti to denote substitution. Uh, one of the things is substitution or in place of. Um, uh, another example of how anti can be used found in the words type and antitype, which are used with respect to Bible prophecy. The type is the pattern or symbol, and the antitype is the fulfillment. So the Jewish Passover was a type, and the crucifixion of Jesus is the antitype, or fulfillment of the example of the type. You substitute the antitype into the symbolism of the type to arrive to the complete meaning. So the, actually, the Catholic Church has essentially confirmed the usage of the word anti. In 1994, Catholic Almanac, on page 158, there is the list of men who claimed or exercised papal office in an uncanonical manner. So these men tried to substitute themselves for the true pope and usurp that office, so to speak. So the Catholic Church denies the papal authority on men on that list because they attempted to substitute a false claim on the papacy. That, that list is a list of anti-popes, is what they call, say themselves. So Catholics clearly use the word anti to denote somebody who is a substitute for something. Antichrist can be interpreted then as somebody who substitute himself for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, just as the antipope substituted himself into the office of the papacy. So in the Catholic Dictionary, the Vicar of Christ, the title used exclusively for the Bishop of Rome as the successor of Peter, and therefore the one in the church who particularly takes the place of Christ, but used also the bishop in general and even of the priests, first used by the Roman Synod of 8495 to re refer to Pope Gelasius, uh, more commonly in Roman curial usage to refer to the Bishop of Rome during the pontificate of Pope Eugene, asserted explicitly the Pope is the Vicar of Christ. Further defined at the Council of Florence in the decree for the Greeks in 1439, the Vatican Council I by Pastor Aeternus. The Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium calls bishops in general vicars and legates of Christ. All bishops are vicars of Christ for their local churches and their ministerial functions as priest, prophet, and king, as the Pope is for the universal church. The title further denotes that they exercise the authority in the church, not by delegation from any other person, but from Christ himself. So the words vicarious and vicar is substitute or place of another. Um, so the papal title of vicar of Christ, which in Latin is vicarious Christe, means a substitute for Christ, which is 
synonymous with Antichrist, um, assuming the power of God on earth, and it's made repeatedly by various popes. Now, some folks out there will claim that vicarious filiae is an anti-Catholic fabrication, a complete fake never used by the Catholic Church. So this was uh, an article entitled A Pope Fiction by Patrick Madrid. And <clears throat> there's another one here by Carl Keating of the Organization of Catholic Answers, where he stated in the following. Um, let's see. Okay, so he talks about the Triple Crown, uh, the beast that can I be identified. Does vicarious filiae add up to 666? Yes, it does, but is that a title of the Pope? Have they ever used it? No, was his assertion. And I've actually got a copy of that article here where he stated the following. Um, if the person making this claim disputes the facts, ask him to furnish even one example of a papal decree, ecclesiastical letter, conciliary statement, or any other official Catholic document in which the Pope calls himself or referred to as the Vicar of the Son of God. He won't be able to find one because none exist. Vicarious Philidei has never been a title of the Pope. Well, well, let's take a look at that now. Let's find out if that's the case. Um... So first we can look at the donation of Constantine. So the donation's con donation of Constantine is the most famous forgery in European history and was discovered in the pseudo-Isidorian decretals in the 9th century. Forgery is thought to be John the Deacon of the 9th century. Um, but the donation in part follows in Latin um, Petrus in Terris vicarius filiae esse viditur constitutus uh, ita et pontifices Quae ipsius principius apostolorum gerunt vices. So uh, the blessed Peter is seen to be constituted vicar of the Son of God on the earth. Now, of course, the argument is, is that all of this was a, a fake and it was a forgery. The problem is, is that popes repeatedly relied on it and used it for hundreds of years. Now, this particular site is old and a lot of the links and original uh, pictures are dead. That's why we're putting it up on YouTube now before it dies. Um, the donation of Constantine has two parts. Uh, the first relates to the alleged conversion story of Constantine to the Christian faith. It's called the Confessio. The second part, called the Donatio, lists the authority, privileges, and property bestowed on the papacy by the emperor. So the emperor, Rome, is bestowing upon the bishop of Rome this kind of authority, supposedly. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, Catholics will say, ah, that's a forgery. You know, you can't rely on that. But it was cited by no less than 10 popes as proof of their civil authority and sovereignty over Rome, what became known as the Papal States, which included a large portion of Italy. It was also eventually exposed as a pious fraud in 1440 by Laurentius Valla, who proved the donation had been written several centuries after the death of Constantine. But the Vatican condemned Vala's scholarly work by listing it in the Index Liborum Prohibitorum. It was a prohibited book. So in other words, they wanted the donation to stand despite it being a fraud. And <clears throat> the official edition of the Corpus Juris upheld the genuineness of the false decrees. So the donation of Constantine was held to be genuine for centuries. In fact, if you spoke against it, your book was condemned. Catholics finally abandoned the defense of the authenticity shortly after Cesare Bonarius published his Annales Ecclesiastica in 1592, which admitted the fraud, although the donation entitled Vicarius Filarei continued to appear in canon law and other publications well in the 19th century. Do you remember that guy who said that this was never used and we were to provide just one evidence of its use in Catholicism's works? Well, we're going to do that. Pope Leo IX, 1054, in Terra Pax Homnibus, um, <clears throat> this was a article right here, and let's see here. We're going to wade through some of this here. Um, so, okay. Yeah, Leo Episcopus Servus Severum Dei. Okay, so... All right, so I, all right, we're going to jump down to this one. I believe I may have this one pulled up. 
but some of these links have broken. Yeah, so vicarious filiae appears in paragraph 13 here, column 643. And I've got some of these pulled up. But Vicar of Jesus Christ, Pope Innocent III, in his Intercorpolia, uh, popularized the title of Vicar of Jesus Christ. He says, <clears throat> um, Non enum humana sed potius divina potestae conjugium spiritual dosovitur cum per translationum uh, vel deposit, depositionum, uh, okay, Romani pontificis que constit essa vicarium Jesu Christe. So vicarium Jesu Christe in his intercorporalia, uh, corporalia, and let's see, uh, we've got more of these here. In the 12th century, century, the canonist John the Deacon wrote Liber de Ecclesia uh, Laternesi of the Lateran Church, and with the text of the donation of Constantine appeared, including Vicarious Philae. So I've got some of these pulled up. So first of all, here's the point with Antichristos. Antichristos is one who puts himself in the place of the Messiah. Um, in this particular work here, Vicarious Enum Jesu Christe Philae Dei, uh, let's take a look and see what particular one? This is the Pontificarium Constitution. So it's a, this is a pontif, pontif Constitution in Bularis Magnu et Romano, Volume 2. This is published by the Roman Catholic Church. So if we go all the way back up to the top here, we'll, we'll take a look at this document. And again, mind you, they say that this was never used. So here we go. Uh, Pontificarium Constitutionum Epitome. So there we go. And is that a seal? Well, that's somebody's seal. Okay. So there's one. This one right here, uh, the Treatise of Lorenzo Valla on the Donation of Constantine, Vicarious Philae in Terris, B. Petrus. So we can see here from the Donation of Constantine that this was a used title. Um, this one right here is really poor quality, but we can see a Vicarious Philae right here. Um, and this is from a, uh, I'll pull up the source here on this particular one here in just a moment. Um, but this is the Index Librorum Prohibitorum right here. And this would have been the work that condemned Vala, who said that, hey, the donation of Constantine is a forgery. I can't remember if this one has Vicarious Philae in it. Uh, it may not. I think this was just, yeah, this was just the work that condemned Vala's uh, work. Now, Pope Paul VI, on his, um, even on the Vatican's website today, says, Errandi uh, filae dei, hic interis vicari petric. So we adore vicarious filae dei, right there, vicarious filae dei in terris. So it's the vicar of the Son of God in earth, or the replacement of, or the one who stands in the place of the Son of God. Um, Paulus Episcopus continued in his Constitutio Apostolica, Arandi Dei Philae Vicarius. So the fact that this title, again, never used by the papacy, it's still up on the Vatican's website today. Uh, Sacro, sac, uh, Sacro Sancta Concilia, uh, we, here we have Petrus Interis Vicarius Philae Viditor, Ese con, uh, constitutus. So here we go. Uh, this is Pope the Ninth, Leo, Pope Leo the Ninth. Okay. So we've got you know original documents here. This is canon law right here. Let's see if I can find this one real fast. Um, <clears throat> let's see. It's like finding where's Waldo. Uh, yeah, there we go. Vicarious Esu Christi. There we go. Romano, the pontific. So the Roman pontiff is Vicarious of Jesus Christ, or the Vicar of Jesus Christ. Um, this is from the Library of UCLA, Canon Law. <coughs> All right, so let's see if we can find Vicarious Philae here. Uh, Romanus Pontifex. So again, the Pontifus Maximus, um, which was a papal title derived direct from Rome. And let's see, it's probably staring at me right in the face here. Okay. Yeah, Vicarious du uh, Christi, Vicarious Christi, right there. Okay, and this one right here, we have Romani Pontificis Vicarious Dei. So 
So this is from the Sexti Decretalium right here, another canon law. Again, we're told that these did not exist and never have existed. Pope Nicholas II, Fundamenta Militantis Ecclesiae, uh, 1278, the Vicar of Christ. So in some cases they have used um, Vicarious Christi instead of Vicarious Philae because it doesn't add up to 666, but then they've gone from the frying pan to the fire because you might as well just say Antichrist at that point. Um, Vicar of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Pope Nicholas IV in 1289, letter to Cadonius the Titar. Let's see if we can pull this one up here, see if we've got a working link here. Yeah, here we go. So this was the one I just had a moment ago. Um, and again, that was from uh, Pope Nicholas IV. So Augustinius Triumphus, 1243-1328, Summa de Potestae Ecclesiastica, 14th century, he's a canon lawyer. So clearly he knew uh, what titles were about. <clears throat> And uh, he clearly identified uh, Vicarious Philae. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So we're going to, we're going to, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, the Pope is said to be the Vicar of God. Solus enum Papa dicitur esse Vicarious Dei, Vicarious Dei, uh, Vicarious esse Dei Philae. Um, these were several questions from his work. So let's see if we can open any of these to see what the original scan would look like. So um, let's see here. Vicarious Dei right there. Papa S. Vicarious Dei. So uh, these are old books, and you got to find them here. But this one, let's see, uh, 14 line from the top. Uh, Vicarious Dei. Okay, so that would be right around here. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Very good. There we go. Vicarious Day, 14th line. So you, you can see on this, and I'm going to put, post a link to this webpage, all of these, Vicarious Philae, I mean, it was just used over and over and over and over and over. Um, this was a very well, well-established, well-used title. Um, so let's see here. The Pope changed the Sabbath to Sunday. So this is the Summa, again, regarding the, the third commandment from the 1582 edition. And it says here, um, first, whether the Pope can grant dispensation that the Sabbath day should be observed in a spiritual sense, not literal. Uh, fourth, whether the Pope may strictly prohibit servile work on the Lord's day. Um, in the same document that applies vicarious filiae to the Pope, credits the papacy with changing God's commandment to the seventh day to the first day of the week, Sunday. Uh, the Sabbath day law, dia sabati in diem dominicum eruri papa mutata es propter significatorum preeminentium. Okay, so the Sabbath day law has been changed by the Pope to the Lord's day due to the preeminence of things signified and the excellent factors in agreement with time and circumstance. So again, the same documents here, um, and specifically they recognize Sylvester I as being the one to change this. And this was a 1582 edition of Summa. So um, Augustinius Triumphus also is also described as a major canon lawyer of the 13th century, a rabid defender of extreme papal supremacy. Um, let's see here. I think this one may still work. Let's take a look here. Yeah. Uh, est enum ipse papa dei filae vicarius. So this would be, um, again, an excerpt from uh, Augustinus Triumphus. All right, let's move on to licet juxta doctrinum, uh, Pope John the 22nd, October 23rd, 1327, um, who said that the Christian Emperor Constantine testified, saying the blessed Peter is seen to have been constituted vicar of the Son of God on earth. From that, it follows self-evidently that Peter can be called the supreme head of the universal church. Um, let's move on. Ecumenical Council of Florence. Um, we've got Execrabilis, Pope Pius II. And uh, let's see here. Pius the. 2nd April 26, 1463, Retractatio in Minoribus Agentibus. Okay, so Jesu Christe Vicarius. Um, Alphonsus Alvarez Guerrero, 1559, Lasoris Christine Religionis. Um, twice, 
It applied the title vicarious filii to the Pope, asserting the authority of Pope over the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, this was a Spanish civil and canon lawyer, noted for his expertise in antiquities of the church and advisor to King Philip II of Spain and Naples. Uh, Cardinal Juan de Torquemada, ah yes, infamous Torquemada, 1561 and Summa de Ecclesia. Let's see if we can open his work here and see if it works. Yes, so this would be the Summa de Ecclesiae. Um, let's see if we can jump to Vicarious. Yeah, here we go, Vicarious. Filae uh, Dei. Here we go. So this is Torquemada, Vicarious Filae Dei, Dicitur Esse Constitutus. Yeah, so we, we read this earlier. This was Torquemada. Um, Blessed Peter is said to have been appointed the vicar of the Son of God on earth. Um, so this was something that was used by popes later on, obviously, 5th, 6th century, but they claimed that Peter was the vicar. Giovanna Battista Zaletti, um, we have here uh, Dei Philae Vicarius in his book uh, Concilorum Seu Responsorum Ad Causis Criminales Recens Editorum. Uh, Antoni Archiepiscopi Florentini, 1581, Summa Sacra Theologiae. Uh, since the Pope is the vicar of the Son of God, uh, sit vicarius filii. So this guy was Archbishop of Florence. Andreas Helwig, of course, in 1612, started recognizing all of this. So the Vatican has had 400 years since the first really good publication adding up the name and equating vicarious filii with 666 to hide evidence and to obfuscate the truth. The problem is, is there's still a lot of it that remains, and anybody who goes looking for it can find it. Now, there's been talk over the years about papal tiaras that had vicarious filii inscribed on them, and we don't really have any good pictures of those surviving, although there have been some Catholic sources that have said, hey, you know, yeah, the title was vicarious filii. Now, since then, of course, anybody who goes and taps them on the shoulder and says, hey, by the way, that's not really the official position. We need to kind of hide that. They'll retract it, right? The, but the reality is, is we do have evidence with photographic evidence of a Belgium tiara that does use the term vicarious Christi, which again is the same thing as vicarious filiae. So it's, it's not a big leap to, to suspect that there might have been uh, tiaras that did add up to vicarious filiae, but the, the church has had 400 years to hide the evidence. I mean, that's a long time before cameras have arrived to go hide, hide evidence and make sure stuff is out of the public eye. So Pope John the 22nd called vicarious filiae in 1669 and 1718. Uh, Mater Dei impetravit in quelis vicarious filiae ratificit in terus. So let's see, if, let's see if this link still works. Yes, it does. So let's see here. Ah, here we go. Mater Dei impetravit vicarius filiae ratifit in terris. So this is, here's the official document. It's on Google Books still. That's the crazy thing is all this evidence is right out there. Um, but people boldly accept whatever's thrown at them. They don't go look at it themselves. Biblioteca Maxima Pontificiae, uh, 1698, Est Vicarius Filiae Sicut Petrus. So uh, this was a teacher and doctor for the entire church. <coughs> He's the head of religion. He is, has Christ. Okay, here's a good one. Vicarius Filiae in Christi, uh, Vicarius Christi, listed as equivalent papal titles. So uh, this is a good point here to say, well, was this ever an enumerated official title of the papacy? Yeah, so let's take a look at these enumerated titles for a moment here. This is from that 1728 <clears throat> document. <clears throat> so here we have Papa es Christi locum tenesus. <clears throat> Papa est caput ecclesiae visibile. Papa est sancto petro tabit potentatum. Papa est vicarius filae dei, sicut petrus et amnis mores si petru non habiet. <coughs> Papa est universalis ecclesiae est episcopus. Papa est, so we have Papa est, Papa est, Papa est. Pope is, Pope is, Pope is vicarius filae dei. 
All right, let's go back here to our, our main page. So um, these were found in uh, an ecclesiastical anthology listing papal names and titles in various texts of the general councils, Gratian decretals, and letters and bulls of the Pope. So clearly, clearly we have evidence here that Vicarious Philae was it. Um, let's see, here we have um, Vindication of the Popes in 1756 with Willibaldum Hessium Stadler, 1756, page 90. Let's see if this one still works. Uh, let's try that again. Yeah, there we go. Christi Philae Dei Vicarius. Jesu Christi Philae Dei uh, Vicarius. Okay. So this is Vindice Sumorum Pontificum Adversis Omnis Generis Adversarios. All right. Um, so, Vincent Houndry, the Society of Jesus. When Honorarius died in 1132, rival groups of cardinals like to Pope, Innocent uh, II, and Anacletus II, which took eight years to resolve. Uh, Innocent was declared to be the valid Pope by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And uh, let's see if we can open up this page right here and see if this one adds up. Yeah, there we go. Philae Dei Vicarius, hic verus uh, regis. So, yeah, it's legit. Um, let's see. Lucius Ferraris, um, he talked about it. Vicarius Philae Dei appears in his books. Wolfgang Fröhlich, 1790, who is Peter? Christe Philae Dei Vicarius. Um, this is Wolfgang Fröhlich. In 1790, Christe Vilae Ivacarius, uh, quis es Petrus, seu qualus Petri primatus, liber theologico canonico catholicus. So, um, yeah, let's see here. So, Abbe Jouam, 1845, um, vic this is in French, Vicari du fil de, de Dieu. Um, sorry, folks, my French is horrible. Um, Let's see here. Cardinal Henry Edward Manning, 1862, Temporal Power of the Vicar of Christ. Uh, again, he Cardinal Henry Edward Manning. All right, our Sunday visitor. Um, there was a question asked of them back in 1914. So clearly this has been around for a long time. And they did admit that the Pope's crown did have vicarious filiae on it. Now, they later retracted that because, obviously, they realized that they'd, they were going to face some heat over that. Um, and let's see. We have quite a few additional references. They, they said this over and over again. So, I, you know, our Sunday visitor, December 1st, 1935, um, Reverend Aquinas Knopf in his editorial states, uh, thus the Bishop of Rome is actually all the title implies by the divine appointment of Christ himself, who is the Son of God. Um, it can be urged with the equivalent description, Vicar of the Son of God. So there was a lot of references back and forth in Our Sunday Visitor about this title. And there was, of course, discussion about sightings of it and whatnot, whether or not this was legit. And the thing is, we don't have those photos. Um, but we do actually being on the tiara, except, of course, for the Vicaris Christe, which is on the Belgium tiara. And I mean, I can understand why. Uh, if you think about when photography came out, by that time, this was well known to be a point of contention. And the Catholic Church has had good reason to perhaps have those, if they did exist, in a back room or hidden. And uh, there's certainly... Uh, some evidence from what Catholic scholars have told us over the years that there was vicarious filiae at one point inscribed. Now, some of them will say, you know, what about Ellen White in 666? Of course, they take a W, which was never translated as 5-5 five, five, or 10 or anything like that. Uh, it doesn't add up to 10 at all in Roman numerals. And she's a woman. She's not a man. So it doesn't fit with Revelation 13 at all. Um <clears throat> But these are the logical attempts that people use to try and escape the looming mountain of evidence here. Rivi Mun, uh, Muniensis, August 9th, 1965, uh, decree of Pope Paul VI, Philae Dei Hic Interis Vicariae. Uh, so let's see if we can pull up this title page here. Uh, nope, that was 
originally linked to the original website here. So again, we're trying to save some of this stuff before the links die. Um, Baff and I, of course, we already went to that one. Oh yeah, these were both Paul VI. They're still available on the Vatican's website today. So, <coughs> yeah. So when we look at this as a whole, the question we have to ask ourselves, <clears throat> let's back up to the top here. Is it true that vicarious filiae was never used by the, by the church? <clears throat> Is it true? I would say with a mountain of evidence, just the accusory evidence that's still available on the internet and scanned in today, <clears throat> not excluding the mountains of evidence that exist at things, places like <clears throat> the Vatican secret archives. Without question, without question, Vicarious Filiae was, in fact, a title used for centuries by the Pope and by Rome itself. But what are your thoughts? Share in the comments below.